you've just been named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. So I think I might just kick it off there with you. How do you feel about that accolade firstly? And how do you think that you're going to use that platform? I think one thing that I often say to people is, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, hard work, but a lot of a team that's made all of this possible. So it's, you know, I'm showing up here um, and it, it looks like it's just me, which would be wrong. And it also looks like I didn't have any uh failures and disappointments along the way, which would also be wrong. And it's just human nature that we focus on all the sort of good stuff that happened and how I've sort of landed in this spot at this moment. My work is fundamentally driven by the idea of human progress. I'm interested in how do we make the world's population better than at least I found it. And uh, you know, there are many different aspects in which to answer that question. Some people Look at look at it in a historical context, and people look at it in a more psychological, human nature type of context. My background's in economics, but I'm very fortunate, as you've intimated, to sit in different rooms. So I straddle yeah. public policy, corporate business, um, as well as uh, as because because I'm on the Oxford University Endowment uh, Investment Committee, being able to be more on this sort of NGO um, uh, type of uh, space. So. Um, I see my um, my career as not being siloed. Um, you know, in all of these areas, we're tackling very similar issues. So a good example would be climate change. Yeah. Obviously, we have, we have a stance on the public policy perspective. I happen to serve on the board of one of the largest uh, energy companies in the world, Chevron. They have a perspective on, on the energy transition. And again, being on the Oxford Endowment, I get exposed to more of a student body, young generation's perspective on uh, on the speed and the nature of change that needs to occur. So I'm trying to weave those different perspectives and sort of come up with a, an agenda that is moving the world in the right direction for progress. Wow. I want to talk to you a little bit about technology and how technology will shape the future of global investments mm -hmm. and what implications do you think that this will have for various industries and companies? Yeah, it's, that's a, a wonderful question. And um, the good news is that there are a lot of extremely smart people around the world focused on this issue. Um, but like most large global complex issues, it's uh, it's going to require some patience and much more deeper learning around um, what is at stake. Um, I'll, I'll say a few things. Um, and, and actually, I delivered a speech at the state opening uh, in the House of Lords uh, during the King's speech last year, looking at the question of AI and in particular and generative AI. And, um, you know, a handful of things. If you look back in history, um, several hundreds of years, the real catalytic, catalytic changes jumps from, from the Middle Ages to, you know, uh, to more capitalist, more globalist societies, more economic progress, for the population, you know, time and time again, they've been driven by technology. So if you think about the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom um, and Britain and what that meant for you know decades and, and actually centuries of progress, it was really started off by a confluence of factors um, which were driven by technology. So put another way, technology has great um, uh, upside in terms of uh, altering the path for human uh, productivity, but also human progress. And uh, it's it, it, you can see it as um, our ability to get access to medicine and healthcare, but our ability to access education, um, it's constantly driving down the costs of access uh, around the world. And that flattening of the world um, to enhance productivity are two things that are particularly important from, from technology's point of view. So it lowers the costs um, but it enhances productivity. Um, and that's really at this stage where that promise lies. Um, however, it would be short-sighted and naive not to also understand that with that technology comes enormous risks. There are geopolitical risks um, of, of state actors or bad actors mm -hmm. um, that might seek to undermine or use technology as a tool for warfare. We've already seen that. Um, but also, like most technologies, uh, a technology uh, um, boom or uh, the advent of technology comes with it, can come with it, um, losses of jobs. So as an example, um, in 1900, the turn of the last century, 
about 60% of Americans were involved in farming. Today, that number is less than 3%. Wow. And we know what's happened. And actually, that's not so dissimilar in places like Europe and the UK. What happened is um, we, we moved the population out of uh, out of agriculture because we had tractors and more automation in the field of farming. So they moved into manufacturing. And then manufacturing also became more and more automated. So people moved out of manufacturing into services, into the service sector. Today, about 87% of the workforce is involved in um, the uh, the service sector, about 18% in manufacturing. And as I said, less than 3% is involved in, in agriculture. Um, and so the question as economists, public policymakers is, uh, where is that proverbial puck going? So if AI does what people, some people think it could do, really eliminate a lot of jobs, then um, what happens? Do people stay at home um, because they don't have any work? Or is there another sector coming to absorb the talent of uh, sort of the, the human worker? Um, John Maynard Keynes, the uh, great British economist in 1930 said that by 2030, we would have a 15 hour work week. Um, so as you know, we're, we're just a few a few hours away, a few days, maybe a few, a few years away, maybe <laughs> from 2030. Um, and when, when they asked, when it was probed about what would happen to humanity if we were only working 15 hours a day, and uh, he said, um, well, hopefully we're not going to be fighting wars. Hopefully we'll be contemplating God. So I think we all hope that if we can find something to do, that it might not be working in a factory, it might yeah. be more creative, but um, it, you know, even more contemporary contemporary projections for what AI and generative AI could do to jobs um, and to company business models um, suggest that they will be job losses. I um, watched your TED talk from 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> called, Is China the New Idol for Merging Economies? Mm -hmm. Um, so I would like to know how your view has changed in the last 10 years and what your TED talk would be called today. Well, if you even I'm want to give sure. another TED talk, maybe you just pass that. I, uh, you know, I, actually, Lords... I think I've given a couple of TED talks. I think um, I, I do TED talks yeah, in the House of Lords now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure there would have been massive changes to the title because I think yeah. the question is still there. And um, as we speak today, China is the largest trading partner, lender, and um, uh, um, foreign direct investor to pretty much all, or certainly many emerging market countries. Beyond that, China is also the largest foreign lender to the US government. It is an enormous trading partner in Europe, as you know, um, and uh, therefore their political and economic imprimatur on the world remains important. We talked very um, briefly earlier, I mentioned geopolitical fissures and some of the challenges in the world today. Um, some would argue very credibly that a lot of that split really that pits China and some a bunch of countries against the West um, is really an ideological split that is led by China's view of the world. Um, they are state a statist economy. The government is very heavily involved in the economy, different sectors of the economy, in technology, in banking, et cetera. Um, Western countries are tend, tend to be much more market-led economies. China has deprioritized democracy uh, Western countries use liberal democracy as their uh, political viewpoint. Why is this interesting? Certainly for a person like myself, and I think most curious minds should find it interesting, is that these two countries, completely different political systems and completely different economic systems, are the number one and two largest economies mm -hmm. in the world, the US and China. So we can't, anybody who's got an inquisitive mind cannot just dismiss China. Um, they work together. They right? work they're very intricately yeah. linked. Um, there's so much symbiosis 
uh, in terms of investment and capital flows, in terms of uh, really being attached to some of the biggest risks that the world faces in terms of headwinds. So in terms of the you know, energy transition and AI, for, for just to name two. Do you want to just give us your take on the year of elections? There are so many countries going through elections this year, which is quite historic in a way. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take globally? Well, I think in some sense, it's it's good that so many countries are going to the polls. Um, I think one of the elections that people have been incredibly work on, incredibly concerned about coming into 2024 was the Taiwan election. And it's gone off pretty smoothly, all things considered. I mean, we thought or many people were concerned it would be a trigger for a, um, a, a military action between the U.S. and China, certainly, but that, that it could spread. And we haven't seen that. Um, Obviously, 2024 is also the year in which we will have uh, India in the polls, Russia in the polls. Uh, as you are probably aware, 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets, and a lot of those countries are, are going to uh, to have elections. Um, the UK and the US um, will both have elections, and uh, it will be the first time they have elections at the same time, and it's in the same year before uh, since of over seventy years. Um, I think it will be interesting because we are seeing a um, a tension or a tug of war between different ideologies, which wasn't really the case. If you think about twenty years ago, um, if I take the United States, you know, there, there weren't massive fissures between the two candidates. Yeah, they were you know, basically middle of the road. They were it's open. So extreme. Now it's very extreme. Um, I was listening to the speech by the new president of Argentina, uh, President Millet. He delivered a speech at the World Economic Forum in Davos, which um, you can say a lot of things about him, but you would be naive not to really find that the speech was quite compelling about free markets and the um, caution around the size of state. It may seem like an old debate, you know, how big should the state be? Um, but I think that is the that is really the battleground for the kind of elections that we're seeing this year in the United States and even here in the United Kingdom, um, as people become much more polarized. Issues such as immigration, you know, national health, um, budgets, government, you know, fiscus uh, are all back on the table, including um, China and geopolitics. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I would say probably this is the mo most aggressive period um, that I've seen the electron, electoral uh, environment. And I think it's also further complicated by, of course, uh, technology and sort of speculation about how that is going to be used to motivate or demotivate voters, but also the vulnerability of the political system to, um, to you know, interventions by um, by bad actors. Just out of curiosity, something that was mentioned for a long time and then has sort of not been discussed now for a long time, but you reminded me when you said a hypothesis that we would all be working 15 hours in 2030. How do people then get remunerated? Is there going to be a universal salary or a universal income of some sort? I delivered a speech um, for an organization called the Arnold, uh, Arnold Harberger uh, Distinguished Lecture last November, where I looked specifically at the question that you pose regarding how do we remunerate? Mm. Um, and it, this is, before I give you the answer, I would say this is a very, very important question because we're now also seeing that a lot of the potential gains from technology, so we talked about costs being reduced, more productivity, those enormous gains might accrue to people who hold capital and not to the labor force. In other words, if you own um, uh, NVIDIA or you are uh, in Google stock, because they are at the coal phase, they are driving AI and generative AI, you could generate a lot more of the gains um, from technology advances than a worker who might get laid off. And so, um, as you recall, I was trying, I was explaining that my life sort of straddles different groups. If when I'm in a corporate boardroom, or if I'm listening to debates on corporate boardrooms, they tend to only think about, uh, or I should say largely think about their business models and thinking about how they can improve their operations by reducing costs and increasing efficiency because of AI. Um, in the House of Lords, 
as a public policy uh, frame, we are very interested in the question that you've just raised. Um, <clears throat> I won't pretend to say this is exactly what's going to happen, but here is one scenario that we could see happening. If you think about 100 people um, in, the, in an economy, and let's say fifth, today 50 of them are owners of capital and 50 of them are employees. If there's a world in equilibrium in the future where 10 people end up owning the gains from AI um, and 90 people are out of work, but the, because the gains are so huge from AI, you could envisage a tax put on the enormous excess profits from the people who own capital in the AI and the technology, um, and that being used as a transfer, as you alluded to, um, in the form of a universal basic income. That's what I would say many public policy officials see as a near term, probably the easy reach solution, because the harder question is, what do we do with a lot of people who are um, in, in some sense uncompetitive um, in manual routinized work if there's no new sector to emerge to observe the population? Now, there are a lot of people who would say there are new sectors emerging. Um, it could be in the health sector, um, you know, as we're, we're living longer, aging populations, et cetera. And so uh, as somebody tells me all the time in Silicon Valley, just because we don't know what that sector is today doesn't mean that's not coming. Um, and so that's great. But in the House of Lords, we cannot do public policy by wishful thinking. We have to make plans that do risk mitigate. And uh, in that regard, I think the UBI, the universal basic income, which I think is, I understand the arguments, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily an ideal North Star um, uh, is definitely an uh, appealing uh, place that people reach for. You talked about the economic relationship between China and the USA. With the trillions of debt the US has to China, could China not just tank the US markets? Further to that, what would happen should the US default on their debt? Whether the US would default or not. You know, when you look at the Congressional Budget Office forecasts on debts and deficits, um, the US deficit now is about 5.8 trillion. Um, there's a lot of worry that the US government today pays more in interest than it does on its military defense. Um, those types of statistics are very jarring and of course make people very nervous about the trajectory of, uh, of America's uh, fiscus and, and whether America will be able to pay Social Security, Medicare and Med Medicaid, which are close to 40% of the, the US budget. Um, however, the, they are the reserve currency today. And um, when you are the reserve currency, there are lots of other tools you can deploy um, before a full out default to try and reduce the cost burden of debt. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. It's been an absolute honor to chat to you today. Thank you. And I feel very grateful and safe in a way that a woman like you is in the House of Lords thank and you. has a voice. Well, thank, thank you. Goodness. Yes, absolutely. And I'll tell you, there are some phenomenal people in general, but the women who are there are spectacular. It is a masterclass in, um, in trying to solve the world's most complicated problems in a um, mature way. I'll leave it at that. I love that. Well, thank you thank so you. much. Thank Dan you for hosting. Thank you.